Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Sunday Messages. And this is going to be an episode like my normal garden variety Sunday Messages podcast episodes. So uh, the first thing, if you're listening or you're watching me on the video version, take a good look at me right now. Do you see this? Have you all noticed that I've been in pretty much nothing but athleisure for a ridiculous amount of time? And I've been living in crew neck sweatshirts. Just take it, take a good look because this is coming to an end. This era of my fashion catastrophe is coming to an end. I had a call with a stylist today and I'm very excited about it because she helped me a lot and I already know what I'm going to be doing differently. And I'm finally getting a grip on the clothing situation because this, this is like not how I feel on the inside. And it's just like to the point where it's absolutely ridiculous that I dress this way. So anyway, I'm just feeling very proud of myself and I'm gloating and I am going to, I am going to be taking care of this immediately. Yes. Abraham Hicks misconceptions. I am, I, uh, the reason why I really wanted to make this episode is because there are so many, there are so many misconceptions. And the reason why this is the case is because the the clarity of technical Abraham Hicks information is so sharp and so precise, energetically speaking, that it can almost be difficult to hear from a human experience and human perspective. So the disconnect is when it comes to human application. So sometimes that's really where they miss each other when we're thinking and talking about energetics is the energetics is one thing and then human application feels like a whole other beast. And so I really wanna create a bridge for everyone today so that the the information sounds clearer and makes more sense and kind of go deeper into the technicalities, but also um, make sure that it makes sense for human application, okay? So that's really my goal with all of this. There was something else I wanted to mention here before we get started. What is this, 444, I love that. It's 244 my time. Okay. So here is the one piece that Abraham Hicks cannot speak to because remember, Abraham Hicks is pure non-physical energy. And this piece is really important because there are some things that come along with tending to the human body that Abraham Hicks is not having the same vantage point. Okay. So for example, Abraham Hicks is not going to be talking about nervous system regulation. Nervous system regulation is a very, very, very dense experience that's rooted in the human body. And so while, yes, we are mostly energy, we're energetic beings, some of the denser aspects of ourselves, you're not going to want to be using Abraham Hicks tools for that. So for example, if I had a client who was like in the trenches with their trauma, I'm not going to be sending them Abraham Hicks segments. If a friend of mine is suicidal, I'm not going to send an Abraham Hicks segment on like happiness and joy that because that's not the right context to be using that those teachings and that information because the energetic frequency is so different and the problem at hand needs a different tool. Like damage control and human issues need more humanly tools, in my opinion. And so I just feel like Abraham Hicks is really precise in in mapping out the energetics of what's happening, but that doesn't always mean that it's going to be the best the best for an acute circumstance or situation. And this is why we have a variety of tools. This is why we have diverse 
um, modalities and healers and, and ways for us to shift our energetic frequency is because there's different situations call for different tools at different times and different seasons of life. And so I, I am just saying all of this because I think some people can get really deep into the material and then take such an extreme perspective that they lose what is contextually relevant for the situation. So I want to clear some of that up, shed some light on some things, and hopefully give you a better perspective when you are listening to Abraham Hicks or you're like feeling really confused by some of the extreme statements that are made. Um Anyway, we're going to be getting into this. The other thing is I do have some questions that I asked Instagram a while ago. And so I have a whole list of questions from the audience and some things that I want to talk about as well. The first thing, the first thing that I want to touch on is the idea of the receiving mode. Okay. And I made a reel about this a while back. I may have posted it on my YouTube shorts. Um, but anyway, I made a video a while back about the receiving mode and how people have like energetically misunderstood the mechanical aspects of it. So the receiving mode, the best description I have is like a valve. So it can shrink, shrink, shrink. And that's when you're going to be more in your pain body. That's going to create more of an uncomfortable experience. If you're, if the valve is super, super, super constrained, the more you open the valve, the smoother things get, the better you feel, the more goods drop in and the clearer you are and the more able you are to recognize it. Okay. So it's partly per it's it's heavily, heavily perceptual, but then there's also the speed in which you receive things really opens up. So for a while, people got into this headspace of the receiving mode being a binary. I am either in the receiving mode or not in the receiving mode. And that's not, that's not the best way to think about it because there's different levels. There's different degrees. Like I said, there's a valve that is expanding as you shift into more receptivity. And then as you descent in terms of mood, the worse you feel, the more constrained you are. And the reason why that matters is it's going to distort what you see around you. It has nothing to do with you being deprived. It has to do with you not being able to recognize what is happening around you. And so training yourself to look for things that are, that you like, or things that are good for you or things that are going well, that requires a certain level of deliberate attention and focus and exercising that muscle. And so what the receiving mode, in my opinion, what it really is, is there's a certain point energetically where the fulcrum tips. And you get into this pocket. I talk about the pocket a lot in terms of meditation, but it can also happen just on a day-to-day -day life experience where all of a sudden the resistance lifts enough to the point where you're feeling good. Things are going well. Things are feeling really smooth. You're going about your day. You're easily accessing appreciation. All of these things start to drop in as a result. And, and it's almost like life begins to glow a lot more in the way that it wasn't before. So that's like when you're highly receptive. However, you have control over the valve opening and closing. That's your work. So when Abraham Hicks is talking about feeling good being, being the goal, or that should be your primary motive, what Abraham is talking about is as you make your way into better feeling emotions, the valve is going to open more. That's why there is a constant harping on make your priority feeling good. It's going to open up the valve. Things are going to go better. Your thoughts, 
your experiences, the things that are happening around you, circumstances, everything will start to transform as you make that the priority. That's energetically correct. It's energetically correct. Now, in uh, from more of like a scientific or psychological perspective, it's like, well, if you have a positive orientation, if you're an optimist, you're going to be happier. If you start looking for things that are good, you're going to feel better. So we can we can break it down into just plain everyday scientific and psychological terms. So it we're we're all trying to get to the same place here. It's not that complicated just the idea of feeling good more and more. The receptive mode, I think more about it as there's a certain point where the fulcrum tips and you get into that pocket where things are going really well. Um, okay. So feeling good, if you took fabric of the universe, you already, you got like the deepest, the deepest and most thorough way that I can unpack this. But Feeling good has to do with emotional relativity. It is not about ecstatic joy or not. It's about what is emotionally relative to the experience that you're having now. For example, I have a client and there, there was a lot of stuff coming up and she was trapped in this energy of defeat. And so I'm like, okay, in order for us to start getting some energy moving, you've got to shift into some anger or blame. Like that, that has to happen first before you can start expanding into those better feeling emotions or even getting to the place of neutrality. And so what was happening was there was so much anger repression that it was starting to manifest in more destructive ways that's not good. Okay. So this is where, when people, when people talk about spiritual bypassing, I talked about this on, um, the Instagram live that I did a while ago. I'm like, good luck. How are you actually going to successfully emotionally bypass? You have to incrementally calibrate it into the next relatively better feeling experience. And sometimes that's anger and sometimes it's apathy and sometimes it's boredom. And there's many different degrees of releasing resistance, if you will. And so it does not always look like feel good and feel happy because it's a relative experience. I'm going to read a comment on Instagram right now. Is there anywhere that I could find a reference for the energetic levels of emotion? Look up the emotional guidance scale. So that has that has like the different degrees of emotion and it'll show you like if you're in depression, that's like one of the worst places that you can be emotionally. So pretty much all you can do is go up from there. <laughs> Okay, so there's a lot of space above depression, many different degrees that you can reach for. And so that would be the reference for that. So you can get a better picture of like, what is emotionally relative to my experience now. And this is why I don't like it when people shit on Abraham Hicks, like, oh, they just talk about feeling good all the time. And um you know, that doesn't work for where I'm at. That's not what's being said. If you listen to a five minute segment that's about feeling good and, and following your bliss and being in joy and, you know, having the world by the tail as a result of you feeling good, that's not the right relative um, teaching for you to be listening to. So it's like, it's energetically correct, but it's the wrong time for you to apply that information. And so this is like my big beef with people complaining about certain things is like, is what you're complaining about correct applicationally speaking? And I think that's a good question to ask yourself anytime you're frustrated with a tool, because I'm a big believer in like, it's not necessarily that we're living in this black and white experience of 
these tools are good and these tools are bad. That's too, that's too simplistic. And I'm, I'm not a big believer in anything actually being like that. It has to do with emotional relativity, where you're at in your life, what's going on for you right now, and what, what makes sense to apply in this moment? What type of emotional or spiritual tool makes sense to apply in this moment? So, okay, let's, let's see. The next thing that I want to talk about is ignoring things. I've made a video on this as well, but I want to, um, I want to speak on it here. So one of the things that Abraham Hicks will talk about is just ignore it, ignore things. And Again, it's context specific. So you're not going to be able to do this with money. You can't just ignore your relationship with money because you're interfacing with money too often. So the odds are that money thoughts, the reason why people really struggle with money mindset, money perspective, money beliefs is because there's so much energy wrapped up around money and there's so many day-to-day experiences and interactions that you're having that connect to money that it's like it can't be ignored so thoughts are going to resurface all the time because it's such a big part of life and this is why so many people struggle with it and so many people want to heal their experience with money or they resent it and they think that nobody should nobody should be rich we should all be poor whatever don't get me started on that but those are the types of things that you can't ignore You do have to do the emotional and the mental work around it. Otherwise, you're not, you're not going to end up recalibrating it. However, the one off random experience that it's, if it's a one off thing and it's unusual and you can ignore it, or it's a random thought that you've never thought before, you can let it die. You can let it starve through depriving it of attention, and it will go away. So that's true. But a a lot of the time, people are trying to do this with things that are way too active, way too prominent in their lives. And then they wonder why it doesn't work. And it's like, well, you're you're actively going to have to calibrate it. You can't just ignore some of the biggest areas of your life. That's not going to fly. So... Ignoring it works in a limited context with limited things. And that's not the first tool that I am usually busting out on a day-to-day basis. So I just wanted to clear that up as well. It is technically correct, but that's going to be extremely difficult to achieve with the important things or the chronic um, patterns, the things that you're interfacing with every day. That's not, that's not the right tool victimhood. Okay. I was also to, I honestly could probably do a whole podcast episode on this. And I think I may have touched on this before. Victimhood is, is a stepping stone on the emotional scale. Okay. So I think it would fall into blame. Now, people get really scared with the idea of victimhood. And the reason why people get scared is they've seen people get stuck in victimhood. So the trick to victimhood is if you treat it like a way to shift between things, it can be really helpful. But if you live there permanently, you're going to suffer and feel miserable. And so victimhood has limited utility. Just like everything else, I talk about this. This is what I've been chanting this entire episode. Is it contextually appropriate? Does the application of this make sense? Is this the right tool at the right time? Those are the questions that you actually want to be asking yourself, particularly with the Abraham Hicks processes and tools, is it has to be relatively appropriate in order for for it to be effective. The same thing goes for victimhood. Don't live in victimhood. You don't want to like build a house in the victimhood zone. And a lot of people do that. And we are afraid of those people because they're out of alignment. So people who are perpetually in victimhood, we don't like them 
generally speaking. They annoy us, they bother us, they complain all the time. It's really hard to be around someone who's in victimhood a lot. It's like, oh man, it, it can be a total wreck. And in the extreme, it can turn into like martyrdom, right? Self-victimization. There's all sorts of ways that that can go sideways. So we don't want to live there, but we need to understand if that actually is a good place for us to shift into in the short term and then uh, continue releasing resistance and making our way back up. Because victimhood, you're not going to be able to just shift into straight up empowerment right away. So it can be a bridge. In the same way I talk about numbing, numbing activities can be a bridge. It can diffuse your focus long enough to where you can pivot sometimes, but it depends. I, I only recommend numbing in very extreme situations. That's not the first tool that you want to use. That's not where you want to go and, and live forever. I've been talking about numbing a lot because I think that that's where a lot of people are trapped right now is they just stay in the numbing zone. So no momentum builds. So things feel really slow and stale and victimhood. I have the same mindset of it can be a good tool in acute situations, but then you want to get out of there right away. Okay, let's talk about another phrase that is misunderstood. That is the phrase, you get what you think about whether you want it or not. The reason why this is misunderstood is people aren't thinking in terms of vibration. They're thinking in terms of material. So what Abraham means by you get what you think about whether you want it or not could simply be an additional thought. We've talked about the 17 second rule. That was like a very, I'm sure a lot of you found me through that 17 second video where I explained, if you hold the thought for 17 seconds, another thought that matches it will come to you. That's, you get what you think about whether you want it or not. It does not mean that as soon as you have a bad thought, poof, it's going to manifest. As soon as you think about a plane crash, you're going to go down in flames. That's not what that means. It just means that you might have more thoughts that are similar come to you. It might be that you have a nightmare. It might be that you kind of spiral out in anxiety. It might be that it, it manifests in thought forms, not material. So the reason why that's confusing is because people are too material oriented, too 3D oriented. And so people start freaking out by the idea of you get what you think about whether you want it or not. It's much, density is much slower than thought. Thought is fast, material is slow. And so that's, that's what that actually means. Okay. So if you're, if you're like, I think the example they used at one point was Esther was watching something about zombies and then she had a zombie nightmare. Okay. That's you get what you think about whether you want it or not. So that's just to clear all of that up. Numbing being the same frequency as waiting. Oh man. Okay. So I, I did that uh, Instagram live the other day. Then I made a post basically saying that numbing is the same frequency as waiting that had an outrageous amount of interactions. I was shocked by how many people were sending that to others because they weren't reposting it, but it was like dozens of people were sending that to others. I was like, okay, there's something, there's something to this. And I think this is why the conversation about numbing has been so active lately, just because there's a lot of people who are resonating with that. Okay. Does the audience have questions? Otherwise, I'm going to start getting into the questions that were submitted to me before, but you're more than welcome to, um, to 
put them in if you have any. Okay, I'm going to dive into this first question. How to not spiral in self-blame for not having healed myself through alignment. So how I, how I see physical experiences is usually... Okay, wait, let me... I, I don't want to say anything that I'm going to regret. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> let me back up. Energy has to go somewhere. So whether it be your physical body, your emotional body, your mental body, the energy is going to go somewhere. So not having healed is the is very similar to saying, I haven't been able to stabilize my mood or I haven't found a way to consistently feel good emotionally. It's just a different um, iteration or expression of that energy. And so the other thing is there is not, there is not healed and not healed. That's not an accurate um, description. It's more of more allowing, more circulating or less allowing and less circulating. So when you start getting out of the black and white thinking around physical body and healing, if you will, um, that will help loosen things up. So it's only, it's only going to make you spiral. If you think about it as I'm not there yet, when really a lot of the time, the healing process isn't, it's not a spontaneous thing. There are people who experience spontaneous remissions. That is a thing, but think about, think about if you had a cut and it was healing, there's different stages to the healing process. So at first it might be a bloody mess and then you clean it up a bit. And then the, the blood starts to coagulate, I guess. Um, there's all of the internal processes that are taking place. Then it starts to scab over, then the scab flakes off. And then there's a little bit of a faint pink, um, some scar tissue that develops and then it heals from there. There's a process to it. So it's not fair to, to say like when you're in the scab phase that things aren't happening or that you're not healing or the improvements aren't there. And so this has to do with black and white thinking. It's not like if I were doing this right, I would be healed by now <laughs> because very few things are like that. You know, if I were to get angry at myself, anytime I have like my OCD flare up, that's just going to make things worse. So it's, if you were to take an emotional approach to it, it would help soften that because it is better to be gentle with yourself and kind to yourself than it is to beat yourself up for things. That is a core thing with Abraham Hicks teachings is like, you want to lean in the direction of being nicer, feeling better, being more gentle. And so it's, people have really distorted the Abraham Hicks stuff. Like, I, like I'm not doing it right when really the it's very simple. Just make it a practice of releasing resistance. That's it. The, like a plus. If you just orient in the direction of releasing resistance, you're a winner. It's don't make it any more complicated than that. And particularly if you're dealing with any type of chronic illness or anything like that, I would, I would emphasize that even more for you. Like, don't allow yourself to, to think about it in a binary to the best of your ability. Think about it as more allowing, less allowing. That's it. 
Okay, the way Abraham Hicks describes feeling good can sound like toxic positivity. Can you expand on that? I think I've already done a podcast episode on toxic positivity, but it really comes down to emotional relativity. So if you're telling someone who's in despair to just be happy, that's not relatively appropriate, emotionally speaking. And if you were sitting in the hot seat in front of Abraham Hicks and you were in despair, they would not take you into ecstatic joy. That's not, that would not happen in a live experience. I can, I've never been to one, but I can tell you right now that would not be advisable because again, everyone wants to like, it wants to claim that Abraham Hicks is talking about toxic positivity based on a very small segment and without taking the full scope of all the teachings into consideration. Like refer to the emotional guidance scale and tell me that that's toxic positivity. Because the, the idea of emotion is, is it's a compass. Your emotional guidance system, it is giving you information uh, it's like your communication system between you and source or you and your soul. So when you think against your soul, you feel worse. When you think in alignment with your soul or closer to your soul, and that might, that might be angry, that might be annoyed, that might be irritated, that might be bored. It depends on where you are emotionally. The closer you're thinking in alignment with source, and that's all, that's all emotions are. Emotions are information. It's not good and bad. It's just, you feel good or bad. That's how we describe it. But it's like, it is, are, are we not all trying to feel good? Isn't that kind of the point? Every single thing that people want on the planet is so they can feel good. Even people who claim to be selfless and like fighting for, you know, human rights and shit like that. It's like, no, no, no. Let's be extremely clear about what is happening. If you're looking at mass starvation and you say, I don't like that. I don't feel good when I'm looking at that. I wish that everyone had more than enough food. That is about you feeling good. Okay. That's you want to feel good. You are uncomfortable looking at other people in pain. You are uncomfortable. And you want it to be fixed so you can feel better. Period. So anytime someone is talking about being selfless, they're fucking lying. Okay. I just want to make that real clear so we're all on the same page. There is no selfless good deed. Good deeds make you feel good. That's all that's happening. So I just need, I just needed to get that off my chest because it ticks me off. That it, And it's also like being a martyr in that case is not going to work. Like self-sacrifice for the sake of others. It's like, that's going to pull you way far out of alignment and that's going to blow up in your face. Anyway, I just needed to say all of that. Um, the entire, every single thing, every single thing that you're wanting is so that you can feel good. So if we all know that that is the core driving force behind literally everyone on the planet, what is toxic about it? The only time people are talking about toxic positivity is when it's not emotionally relatively appropriate which is why I, I am going on and on about emotional relativity. That is like the one part of the conversation that nobody wants to recognize with Abraham Hicks. And it's like, I mean, it, depending on how deep into the material you've gone, it's kind of like willful ignorance to say that Abraham Hicks is toxic positivity because Abraham Hicks would never tell you to just be happy if you were in despair. That, that has never been taught. That has never, ever, ever been taught. Okay, 
Do you have to be in a good feeling state to bring in good? No. No, you don't. Feeling good will allow you to see it more clearly and more often. Feeling good will allow you to have the full bodily sensation of it more often. Feeling good will make good things more apparent to you, more evident. Um, but I think all of us have had the experience of like being really afraid that we weren't going to make the money or that we weren't going to be able to pay for something. And then the money came through, even though we were afraid. Okay. So a, a, good things are all around you all the time, whether or not you can see them, that's more of the issue. It's heavily perceptual. So exercising a good feeling will allow you to see them more. And then that compounds as a result. So your good feeling, like feeling bad, isn't going to shut everything out. It's just going to distort your vision and it's going to slow, it's going to bog everything down, so to speak. But it doesn't mean the good things have gone anywhere. It doesn't mean that they're not around. It doesn't mean that the blessings have stopped flowing to you. Those are still, those are still making their way to you, but you're just not attuned to see them clearly and, and really allow them into your awareness. That's what it really is. So again, like if the valve is wide, if you're feeling amazing, if you're feeling incredible, it doesn't really matter what type of environment you're in, you're going to be able to magnetically pull in the goods, so to speak. When she says that the point of attraction stops when you sleep, I don't believe that. Okay, so this concept might be one of the most difficult to master in my opinion. Like this is this is something that's even difficult for me to like really 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 capitalize on. But again, it's technically correct. It's technically correct, but being aware of it is really difficult. So when you first wake up in the morning, uh, I think this is your question. I'm responding to someone on Instagram for the podcast listeners. I think this is your question. Um, so I'll talk about nightmares and dreams because I know that that's like the, the rebuttal that will come, but let me explain the technical side of it first. When you sleep, it suspends momentum. So there is like, you come into this neutral point. And when you first wake up, there's a pocket of neutrality that you first wake up with. Now it can tip either way. You're not necessarily going to wake up bright eyed and bushy tailed, but it is neutral. It's like, there's that, there's that calm space where it can go either way. And sometimes I swear to you, I'll wake up and have this recognition of like, oh, I'm there. I'm in that pocket. I can feel the neutrality of the moment. And then a thought will come into my mind or I'll remember something from yesterday and it vanishes. So if you've ever been in that like half awake, half asleep state, um, this is one of those things that, that you can kind of feel and pay more attention to is like, oh, I'm not really thinking about anything. I'm feeling good. Nothing major is happening, right? You're just feeling into that, like gentle awakeness. Uh, usually there's a pocket that is the, the thoughts and emotions are not strong enough to, to get the momentum moving on anything. And so then when you start thinking and remembering and looking at your phone and all that shit, that's when things go into the weeds. Okay, let's talk about dreams. How we experience dreams is like we, we go into the astral and we're surfing around. That's not 
quite right because the astral plane is timeless when you really are thinking about it. It's like there's no there's no time, which is why you can have someone who's in a coma, for example, feel like they're having an alternative life like years and years and decades where they have a family and children and a whole other career. And it's because the astral plane is timeless. And so there is, there is no, we are going somewhere for hours because the idea of hours and a block of time is something that only exists in a time and space reality or a time and space dimension, which is where we are on earth that doesn't apply in the astral realm. So dreams, the way Abraham Hicks describes a dream is it's almost like an instantaneous downloadable file. It's a good way to, it's a good way to think about it. So it, it would still operate the same way where there is that pocket of in-between space where you have reset you have reset um, your energy, but as soon as you wake up, if you have all that um, all that chi come through, like because it is, it's like this cosmic block of chi that drops into your body and memory, and you know, and it can come from a lot of things. It can come from momentum from the day. It can come from stress. It can come from whatever, or it can be good things as well. So when that energy is dense enough to the point where you actually have conscious memory of it, it feels like there's no gap, even though on a, on a technical level, there would be, but, but as someone who actively dreams quite often, it's like, of course it doesn't, it doesn't feel that way because the amount of time is like an instant. It's like we might have an instant of that neutrality before all of that energy comes through and we have the experience of remembering a dream. So again, it's it's technically accurate, but the human application of it is just not the same. So it's not the easiest thing to... Um, it, <laughs> Honestly, like I started paying close attention to it for quite a while and it took me like months to start getting the hang of it because our minds really want to focus and it wants things to do. And so it would start focusing on things that were happening yesterday, what I have going on today, all of this other stuff, something that I'm annoyed with, a problem that I want to solve. And so it is not an easy practice, but it is absolutely a thing. Okay, not being able to have bad feelings or being able to exist in how life is now and enjoy it. So again, not having a bad, not ha not being able to have bad feelings, that's not, that is not a part of the Abraham Hicks teachings. You can have bad feelings, just don't, don't make it, don't make it a career out of staying there permanently to the best of your ability. Like once you know about it, you know that negative emotions have more to do with um, whether or not you're resonating with your source, you're resonating with God, you're resonating with your soul, however you like to look at it. That's what a bad feeling actually is, is not being harmonious with it. And you need that information. It's important. If you didn't have bad feelings, then how would you know what good feelings are? How would you be able to tell? It's a part of your compass. You have to know what bad feelings feel like. You have to know what that negative emotion actually is. And so being able to enjoy life, it's like, well, it, it depends on where you're at when when I was in that depression, it was like a 10 day, it was like a wicked depression for like 10 days. When I was there, I wasn't putting pressure on myself to like go to the beach and have the time of my life because that's, that wasn't going to cut it for me. That wasn't the right next step for me. So it, it's, there's, there's no pressure to reach ecstatic joy. 
you know, it, and I use ecstatic joy as the example because it's just so high up emotionally speaking, vibrationally speaking, that it's like, that is, that is not, that's not the only dimension that you have to play in emotionally. You, you have plenty of wiggle room and your negative emotions. It's like, it's just giving you information. And then your job is to know how to shift emotionally and start releasing more, more resistance. That's your job. That's all the teachings are about is like release more resistance. If you're feeling bad, you're having a contrasting experience. Okay. And that's fine. You launch stuff into the vortex. You know that that's there energetically. Now you're going to want to harmonize with your source more closely. And getting there is something that like, like we already mentioned, sometimes it is frustration and anger and um, boredom and annoyance. Like those, those things, those things are steps along the way. So that is what I have for you there. Now that was all the questions that I had about Abraham Hicks and we've been going for 45 minutes or so. So uh, let's see. The other thing that I want to mention, of course, is uh, speaking of Abraham Hicks, and I know the other day we were talking about step three, we were talking about the receptive mode. And this also goes in, uh, this ties into everything about, you know, appreciating life and doing things that uh, bring you joy and following your bliss. Big kid school, big kid school. I'm not, I've already done a gazillion videos about it and audios about it, but here's the breakdown for anyone who's curious. Every week, I send you an email announcement about the theme that we're going to be exploring that week. Okay. I'm actually really excited for the email component because I feel like I want, I just want to judge them up a lot. And I feel like I'm really going to have fun with the emails in this course, which I've never, I've never been into before, but I'm really excited about it. I like writing emails to everyone. And so I'm going to announce what we have going on. Then we're going to get on a group call every week and we're going to start mapping out this this theme, how this is going to look for you this week so that you can explore, you can play, you can uh, do the things that you've been wanting to do. It's where we stop overthinking things and we actually bring them to life. Instead of just thinking about all the things that you would like to do at some point one day, maybe kind of sort of, this sounds like it would be fun. It's where we actually do the things. We actually put it, put it on the calendar. We actually put it on the books. We book the tickets. We make the reservations. We go to the places we've been wanting to go to. We make the restaurant reservations. We try the new recipes. It's like all like the richness of life that you have been waiting for. We are doing it now. I honestly, I've been thinking about this because we start June 1st. I'm like, oh my God, it's going to be the best summer ever. I'm telling you right now, I'm calling it now. This summer of 2023 is going to be, at least for me, it's going to be the best summer of my entire life. And then the other thing that I've been thinking about <laughs> is that we finish at the end of August, then we're going to start shifting into the fall months. And you know what, you know what happens during the fall months? We're in the fourth quarter. Okay. And you all know my obsession with the fourth quarter and how big of a deal that is, but I am just like, I'm so excited for everything that's going to happen this summer, because I feel like everyone who's in big kids school is going to be set up for a completely different fall and holiday experience, because you're going to have like been in the gym for months and months and months. You know what I mean? Like this actively intentionally curating the type of life that you want to be experiencing in terms of fun and pleasure and play and satisfaction and all of the things that you've been putting on the back burner, like actually, actually going out and having the fun and doing the things, how that's translate into the fourth quarter. I'm very excited to see what happens for people. So I feel like it's just going to have, it's going to have such a big impact on 
how things are moving forward and quality of life and having fun. And I'm, I'm just excited to see what people are going to start, where people are going to go, what they're going to do, who they're going to meet, like all of the things that are going to happen as a result of like going out into the world and really allowing the universe to meet you, allowing just, oh my God, I'm, uh, I could like erupt with excitement. I'm just very excited to see everyone. Big kids winter. Yes. Yes. It's like big kids ski season. <laughs> or, um, I mean, I know everyone in the Southern hemisphere would be, it would be, uh, you know, winter time for people in the Southern hemisphere, but I'm just, I'm just thrilled. I'm just freaking excited about all of this. And, um, yeah. So anyway, links in my bio and is in the description box. It's in the show notes and it's in all the places. If you have any questions about it, please reach out to me. I've had a lot of people asking questions um, and I'd be happy to answer. And yeah, that's a wrap friends. Thank you so much for hanging out and I will talk to you all later.